And the best example that I can give that's relevant right now is the largest study that explores long COVID that enlisted over 5 million eligible participants was only 15% African American. And we know that COVID-19 disproportionately impacted minorities the most, but we are not the ones that are represented in that data. So we have got to engage ourselves in this work. So if you are here, you have a commitment to that work. So please take advantage of the studies, take the information back to the people that you know. We recognize that there is a distrust in this country between African Americans in the Institute of Western Medicine. But I think that we've got to push beyond that so that we can be um, represented. So we have a wonderful program that has been curated, but I have the esteemed pleasure of introducing um, the honoree. And so the honoree, um, Miss Betty Hoops, and I have a bio for her that's amazing, Miss Betty Stewart, I'm sorry, a 50 Hoops. She was born in Wharton, Texas. Her childhood began in the greater third ward area in Houston. She attended public schools throughout the community, graduating from Jack Yates Senior High School. Yes. Yes, ma'am. While continuing her studies, her career hit the ground as she accepted a position with Texas Instruments. She was later employed by MD Anderson before progressing to Southwestern Bell Telephone Company, where she retired after many years of service. In retirement, Betty continued to provide consulting services with Windsor Village United Methodist Church, where she immediately made an impact on serving the church family as well as surrounding communities. This line of work has brought her fulfillment, giving her the drive to do more for others. Throughout the years, Betty has continued to be a faithful servant of God, servicing and addressing healthcare obstacles for those who are underprivileged or unable to find reliable resources. Betty has made processes seamless by incorporating healthcare events post church services, including the weekend. These events include assistance during open enrollment for the affordable healthcare marketplace plans, health and wellness services, free immunizations for both kids and adults, cancer, diabetes, and hypertension screening. Church members directly meeting with medical professionals for discussions, consults, problem solving, and an array of healthcare needs. Those who are unable to attend have been awarded direct calls from various services and resources to include all participants. Because of Ms. Betty, no one is ever left behind. Betty unselfishly gives her time and attention to everyone that's in need. She conveys her love for God has led her to this moment that allowed her to do what she loves which is serve him. Her compassion and love for others is exemplified in the time, effort, and services she gives to other people. Miss Betty, you are being honored today. And it is worth like what you do. Yes. That makes these initiatives so sustainable. So I would like to call up Jornay Riddle to make comments about Miss Betty. Okay, they want me to sit down. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jornay Rito. I'm going to read from my notes so that I ensure that I'm timely. Um, but really honored to be able to speak um, highly of Miss Betty. Uh, so for the past five years, I've had the privilege of working alongside Ms. Betty on a community grant. Um, Ms. Betty embodies the true essence of a servant leader with a deep passion for bettering our community. Over these years, she has been more than a colleague to me. She has been my advocate, intercessor, comforter, and cheerleader. I'm continually amazed by her journey, the spaces she's navigated, the, achievement, the achievements she's accomplished, and the trials she has overcome. Ms. Betty is not only wise, but also a bit spicy at times. <laughs> Always ready to tell it like it is, 
Uh, her candor is always warranted and adds to her authentic, inspiring presence. Her steadfast faith and wisdom are truly inspirational. I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity to learn from her, uh, to learn from her and witness her remarkable impact firsthand. While I do sometimes worry about her work-life balance, <laughs> we have some amens. I know Miss Betty will always follow her heart and dedication to serve. Thank you, Miss Betty, for your incredible contributions and for being such a profound source of inspiration. I truly love you. Yeah. So we are going to get into a bit of pomp and circumstance for Miss Betty, who has committed her life to this work. Okay. Miss Linda Giddings. So next, I want to call the NBLIC past chair. I'm so sorry. I, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Betty, I know this, this is a surprise to you, but we did, uh, oh, snap. <laughs> we did, uh, we would be remiss if we did not honor you, uh, your original life, which we call cancer. We don't call it cancer committee. We call it life uh, committee members. And I want to ask that they would stand. They're kind of spread around the room, uh, I think. Some at the table, Mr. Moorhead, Ross is here. There are some who could not be here today, but oh, here comes Brenda. Okay, we'll sing in. And um, what we want to do is present this to you, and it is for you, because we know you, okay, to take a personal day of R&R &R just for you. And, and just in case, Lena, stand up. Uh, this she is a witness, and she will give me feedback that you did what we're asking you to do. We love you. We appreciate you, and may God continue to bless you with many, many more years to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Giddings. And now it's time for the pomp and circumstance. Y'all see how excited I am. I'm ready for this. Okay. So I want to call up um, the past NBLIC past chair, Cassandra Harris, and co-chair Erica Primeris for the ceremony. Does anyone have some of that pomp and circumstance music? <laughs> okay. We're going to read some information about 50 Hoops, and then we're going to call Miss Betty up. She has on her graduation cap, and since I'm a past legend, I have on a black cap. So here we go. All right. So the 50 Hoops Legends is a national coalition of individuals from doctors and researchers to enthusiastic patients, survivors, and community advocates from Rion teaching hospitals and renowned teaching hospitals and cancer centers to mega churches and rural communities, from national patient education organizations to medical professionals. Since 2021, the legends have conducted or participated in at least six of the 50 Hoops branded events. Having conducted virtual conferences and workshops for nearly four years, we continue to grow the number of organizations, churches, and patients who have been benefited. And as a legend of legends, we are all become a part of the national coalition of advocates for our communities. Each shares a singular passion, educating African-Americans and those experiencing disparities about health and medical resources to their local communities. Through digital or live events, we will continue to focus on screening, understanding treatment options, helping communities understand the importance of clinical trials. And the list goes on, tirelessly seeking testimonials from people who look like us and updating audiences about diseases critically affect, critically, that have critically affect our lives and the lives of our families and communities. In naming new legends, we seek to expand our network with those who have shown interest in the communities they serve, which mirrors our combined goals. Understanding that no man is an island, and by working autonomously 
in natural synchronicity with each other and in the rhythm of what God has intended for each of our lives, we can reach not hundreds, but millions. Now we ask Ms. Betty to come forth. Ms. Betty, as a veteran 50 Hoops legend, I have seen collaborative work with others, witnessed your devotion in providing programs of excellence to our community, to your congregation, and showing your love for others through your help and assistance. You have been chosen by the legends who unanimously believe that what we will do together as a coalition of 50 Hoops legends annually will be unique impactful and authentic, just like the founders intended. And that's Pat and Ed Sanders. Raise your hand again. <laughs> we will now have the turning of the tassel. <laughs> <laughs> to your right. You and let's applaud Miss Betty for her graduation. <laughs> I would like to thank you all for the recognition. I'm truly humbled. I am the one that normally gives and not receives, so it's not a comfort zone for me. <laughs> but I love to help people. It's a passion. It's a gift. And God did not intend for us to do it alone. So because of that, we have ministries. We have members in the ministry. And my high school teacher is here with me today. And he's not only here with me today, he's been with me through ministry. He's the pastoral care leader of life ministry. And it's been an honor and a privilege for everyone that has led and been a part of the ministry to, in, to see it into other people's lives. As we give to others, God gives to us. And that's the story that we need to tell. Thank you. The certificate reads, Certificate of Accomplishment, 50 Hoops Legend of Legends, in grateful appreciation for your dedication to your African-American community's patient education outreach, for your dedication and passion for your mission to keep your community informed and updated about prostate cancer and clinical trials. 50 Hoops Legend, Ms. Betty Stewart, August 3rd, 2024, Houston, Texas. Momentarily, there will be a panel, but before the panel, I want to introduce um, the panel moderator, Dr. Deidre Carol Coleman. Dr. Coleman, clinical research scientist in the Department of Health Disparities Research at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, designs and conducts research focusing on the elimination of cancer-related health disparities among racial and ethnic minorities. She uses community-based participatory research methods to address these disparities. Dr. Coleman has nearly 20 years of public health research experience focused on a broad range of health topics, chronic disease, substance use and abuse, sexual health, and based in a variety of settings, churches, schools, community centers, homeless shelters, and low-income hospitals and clinics. Currently, her research focuses on the role of physical activity is a key preventative behavior and obesity as a major determinant of cancer disparities among racial and ethnic minorities. She is also interested in religion as a social determinant of health and the influence that faith has on health behavior and healthcare decision making in particular. Dr. Coleman holds a bachelor's degree in applied sociology from Southwest Texas State University and a master's degree from UT Health Sciences in Houston. She holds her doctorate in public health studies, and she is focused on health promotion and behavioral science. 
Before joining MD Anderson as a clinical research science, Dr. Coleman completed her postdoctoral fellowship at UT and was a non-resident research fellow with the Religion and Public Life Program at Rice University. Dr. Coleman is a well-rounded scientist. She is a former collegiate basketball player in her free time. She enjoys supporting her hometown Houston Rockets, volunteering with the Forge for Families and Restoration Community Development Cooperation, reading books on history and self-improvement, and swimming. Okay. Without any further delay, I want to introduce Dr. Deidre Coleman. Thank you, Zuri. Good afternoon, everyone. How are y'all doing? How are y'all feeling? Feeling good? Y'all look good? <laughs> well, look, before we jump into our panel discussion, I just want to say, can we, can we celebrate Miss Betty again? Miss Betty, you deserve it. I, I, I know. <laughs> you know what? On uh, behalf of Dr. Lorna McNeil, I just want to thank you. Um, and the entire Windsor Village Church family for your partnership over the past 15 years. Um, I know that you don't like all of this attention, but you deserve all the flowers. And so we're going to take this opportunity to give them to you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Many of you may not know this, but MD Anderson has a research office just down the hall from here. And that really uh, provides an opportunity for us to um, connect with and collaborate and engage the Windsor Village community. Um, and not just Windsor Village, but the broader community as well. Engaging our community partners is such an important part of what we do. Uh, it ensures that our research uh, really addresses the concerns of the community and also that the solutions, the potential solutions that we come up with are not just informed by the community, but developed in partnership with the community, which is really, really important. So we're tremendously grateful for that space and a lot of ways that has made what we do uh, possible. So grateful for that. Um, as Zuri mentioned, my name is Deidre Coleman. I will be moderating our panel discussion today. Um, and the purpose of this discussion is really to begin to reimagine uh, how we think about research participation, to broaden the scope, uh, to, to, to broaden the scope around what we think about when we think about engaging in research. And to really, um, as Zuri mentioned earlier, uh, think about why African-American representation is so important uh, for science and research. Um, our organizers have put together a phenomenal group of panelists that I'm excited for you all to hear from. Uh, they bring a, a wealth of knowledge and a diversity of lived experiences uh, that make uh, their, um, their, their participation here just essential. And so I'm excited for you to hear from them. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, share with you their bios um, and, and we can jump into our discussion. And you all can just come up as I introduce. Um, so first up, I'd like to introduce Ms. Bridget Chapatal. Bridget is a seasoned health education professional with more than two decades of experience in the biomedical research industry. With a remarkable career spanning key roles at leading academic and medical institutions, she honed her expertise in culturally inclusive clinical trial operations. As a purpose-driven science communicator, she raises awareness about all things clinical research. Bridget is the founder and current director of Hypothesis Haven Science Club, which is the first and only medical science program for children ages 6 to 12 years old. Thank you for being with us, Bridget. Also joining our panel is Ms. Wanda Hobbs. Ms. Hobbs has been a member of Windsor Village United Methodist Church since 1993 and has participated in many ministries and programs at the church, including Project Church. She later became a member of MD Anderson's Community Science Program and loves helping researchers think about their studies from the community's perspective. Ms. Hobbs is a former elementary school educator who now works as a licensed professional counselor, helping her clients improve their quality of life. Please join us, Ms. Hobbs, and thank you so much for being here.
And finally, we have Dr. Joy J. Malbro. Dr. Malbro has over 20 years of experience in healthcare, community, community engagement, leadership, and staff development. Her current work with Inside Edge Consulting Group allows her to partner with national clients, engage communities, and provide clinical research education to underrepresented populations. Will you please join us, Dr. Joy Malvro? We're so glad you can be here. It is such an honor to sort of uh, share the stage with you ladies today. I'm excited to, to jump into our discussion. Uh, before we do that, though, um, I, I want to let our audience know how this is going to go. So I'll kick things off by asking each of our panelists a, a few questions about the specific ways that they engage in, in research. Um, the, the hope is that this can really um, begin to sort of get, get you to thinking about what it looks like to be an advocate for research and also participate in research. I want you to um, be thinking about what questions you have, because after I ask my questions, I'll pass the mic to you and it'll be your turn. Sound good? All right. So, Bridget, I'll start with you. Uh, you are the founder of Hypothesis Haven Science Club, which I'm super excited to hear more about. Um, but before we go there, tell us a little bit about your journey. How, what sparked your interest in science and research? Sure. So... Uh, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so basically, I have been interested in science pretty much all my life. Um, I am a um, child of Nigerian parents, Nigerian heritage. And, you know, coming to this country, it's really um, something that was really strong in our culture, just, you know, a, a, a feeling of excellence in everything that you do. And so um, my parents did steer me towards science. My mom is a nurse, but I always knew that I wanted to work somewhere within the medical industry. I just didn't know exactly what. And so, you know, I feel like it was a blessing once I graduated from college, you know, I did major in health science. And so I knew vaguely what I wanted to do, but I was very blessed that when I moved to Houston after college, my very first job was working for a physician that was actually conducting cancer clinical research. And so that was my introduction into the industry. I didn't even know it existed, even though I'd gone to school and, you know, been around all these different um, scientific um communities. But, you know, as Dr. Zuru was saying, it's just not something that you see or that you even are aware of. And so I felt very blessed to be in that career. But I was looking at, well, how can I let more people know about this? You know, how can I share, you know, this really amazing industry with others? And so um, that was kind of what has brought me kind of to the point where I'm in my career, where I'm actually like doing that and actually letting people know about um, clinical research um, and, and, and the benefits that it can have on our, on our lives. Awesome. And so tell us a little bit about when and why you started the Hypothesis Haven Science Club. All right. So it kind of dovetails into what I was um, explaining before. Um, essentially, once I had children of my own, um, I was looking for programs that they could be a part of that um, taught them about what it was that I was doing all day long. I mean, they knew that I worked with a doctor, I'm trying to cure cancer, but they knew that I wasn't a doctor, I wasn't a nurse. So it was kind of like, well, what, what are you, you know, mom, what are you doing at the hospital? <laughs> you know, and so I would look for programs that they could be a part of that were STEM programs that would introduce them to these different concepts, but there actually was nothing that showed them about clinical research. And so I just thought, okay, well, I'll just start one. You know, I have an um, education background. I have a graduate degree um, in health education. And so um, I use that knowledge and then also just um, coming up with lesson plans. I work with um, some educators and some scientists really on in the process just to come up with really hands-on lessons that children could learn that while they're playing and while they're having fun, it's actually teaching them um, those skill sets that scientists use to discover, treat, and cure diseases. And so from that, Hypothesis Haven Science Club was born. Um, we initially started out in 2019 as an after-school program. Um, but of course, you know that that very next semester when COVID happened, all the schools shut down. So it was a bit stressful because I had left my job to start the organization. But from there, we um, morphed and we have now become a community engagement program. We come to churches, we go to schools, we do things like Girl Scouts, private um, community events. And our goal really is just to ex give children that early exposure to clinical research careers. So children, we're talking from elementary school ages, give them that early exposure um, so the children can, they can't be what they can't see. So in that way, we're just giving them that exposure. But then we also have hands-on workshops where we actually learn about diseases like cancer, diabetes, heart surgeries. We learn about the ways that all these different things work and give kids sort of that insight and that information that they can then take on as they, as they grow. 
That's awesome. I, I love hearing about that because we can't be what we can't see, right? So that's just so very important. Now, a little birdie told me that you're called the, the clinical trials lady on social media. How did you get that title? Well, so, okay, all of you, you can pull out your phones. If you're on Facebook or on Instagram, it's at Clint Charles Lady. Um, and so basically what the way that, that came about is that we know as women in this group, we're normally the caretakers of our family, making sure that your children, you know, your husbands, your partners, your community members are all taking care of their health. But a lot of times we're the ones that, you know, we kind of put our health on the, on the back burner, right? That's a very common. And so I started Clinical Trials Lady just as a way to provide education and awareness um, and advocacy for a lot of the diseases that impact women in our lives. And so it's on social media. I post short videos, short clips, just informational, just letting women know about a lot of the health, um, a lot of the health conditions that impact us. And really what got me started is that really women were not even required to be in research until 1993. Before that time, they would study men and just say, okay, well, this is what works in men. So I guess it's going to work in women as well. That's not true. The problem with that is that there's a lot of diseases that, first of all, show up differently in women, um, you know, depression, anxiety, uh, you know, all these different types of diseases, even heart disease, they manifest differently um, in men. Heart disease might feel like a pain in the chest, but in women, it might feel like a crushing feeling. And so what happens is that women might have that same deadly condition, but they're not finding out because all of the information we have out here is how it impacts a man. Same thing with medications. Um, there are medications that they are processed differently within women. And then sometimes they can even be more harmful for women than men. And so I just really wanted to have a platform where I share that sort of information so that women can make empowered decisions to guide our own health journey. Awesome. That education is so important. So I'm going to turn to Ms. Hobbs next for a couple questions. Um, and actually, I'll come come right here just so that I can pass you the mic. Um, so I know that you have participated in uh, Project Church and a number of research studies um, that uh, either MD Anderson or other healthcare organizations um, have brought to, brought over to Windsor Village. Tell us a little bit about why you chose to participate in research and what you what kinds of things you've been asked to do when you participate. I'm naturally a curious person. So I wanted to know what the clinical research was all about. I wanted to have information when they asked, what is it? What does it mean? Because nobody I knew was really talking about it. So Project Church was a great introduction to it. So we got a chance to see and find out. And I was interested in eating healthy, as I was telling you at the table. Eating healthy is the key to our health, I have found out. And so I'm still working on mine, but Project Church started me with, an, it fast, fostered my curiosity. We would come to the church, we would fill out information, questionnaires, asking you about your health. We would participate in certain programs. They might tell you to do certain things for a week, certain things for two weeks, certain things for three weeks, and then they can measure the performance of the change or the difference that took place. I also started participating in clinical trials outside the church, and they would often take, draw. and I was a little nervous about this, they would draw your blood. They wanted to test how it was before and how it was after. Now, that's a little scary, but I got over it. It didn't kill me. You know, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So I was just a very curious person and wanted to see if any of these things could help me get better. Because I also had some health challenges. So I was looking to also see if my health could improve by going and learning more about what was wrong, what else I could do to get better. So I have continued to do that in something, a program that you'll hear more about as we talk called Community Scientists, where I'm learning what the researchers are doing. And it's really been very informative, very educational, and I just love it. Great. And so, yeah, you, you have participated for what, maybe three or four years in the MD Anderson's Community Sciences Program? Five years, wow, okay, and thank you for your service, that's super important. Um, tell us a little bit more about um, your role as a community scientist and sort of what your experiences have been like. I usually don't need a mic, but just in case people in the back can't hear me. 
The community science program is monthly. At least it started out to be a monthly visit to MD Anderson. And a group of us would come and sit at a round table and they would talk about research that's being done and they would ask our opinions. Can you imagine that? They would ask our opinions of different things, different steps about the research. And it turned out that the opinions we were giving, and there was a multitude of people that were asked. I love the diversity. So you'd have people, Caucasian, Black, Hispanic, Asian, and you'd have different age groups of people, and you have men and women. So you get to hear what they said, and they get to hear what you said, and you find out some people thought differently, some people thought similar to you. So that was very good. But the research was so fascinating because they did a wide range of research. So then the pandemic came. You remember that. So we could not meet in, fa in person, face to face, so we started meeting on Zoom, which worked out even better. You didn't have to go anywhere. Go to your computer, go to your phone. So we meet usually once a month, but recently we've gotten so popular, we are meeting two times a month, sometimes three or four times a month, but it's at your convenience. They meet at noon, which is most people's lunch hour. So even if you work, you might be able to still participate. I'm retired. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and then they meet at 6 p.m. And it's only one hour. So it's kind of concise. The researcher presents the information of what they're looking for, what their study involves. They put it on the screen or they used to give you handouts. And then they go through it. And it's fascinating the multitude of studies that MD Anderson and their partner groups are doing, you'd be surprised. And it's things that you'd be interested in knowing about. It's not something obscure that you never heard of. One study recently was about the BRCA gene for breast cancer, which family members, not direct family, but indirect family members in my family have had and unfortunately have died from. So I was very interested in hearing about that one. I, I'll say I've been the beneficiary of the community scientists and we just have blind spots sometimes, you know, and so being able to have that feedback is so vital. We don't just hear it. We change our proposals. You know, we make different decisions based on what we hear um, from the community's perspective. And that, that's an opportunity that we all that, that you all have an opportunity to participate in. Um, and so thank you for that. Can you think of a particular memorable experience that you may have had um, as a community scientist where you had, you engaged with the researcher and you were able to uh, give input that really made a difference? Recently, we were treated with the experience of what they called an elevator speech by students, medical students, graduate students, students who are working in clinical trials with doctors and researchers. And they were charged with coming up with a speech that would explain to you and I what their study was about, as well as to professionals who were in the field doing that type of research, which is very, very challenging, I found out. They were supposed to make it so that the lay person would understand it and that the researcher would also see that they knew what they were talking about. And so we had first year and we had all the way up to fourth year students. And they asked us as community scientists to give us their, to vote on it sort of, to give us an opinion, to give the students an opinion as to how they did to rate them. Were they very good? Did they, do, did they solve the problem? Was it clear? Was it concise? What could make it better? And this was challenging. Because many of the topics they were talking about were maybe some that I was familiar with, some that I was not familiar with, and had technical terms in them. But some of the students, uh, naturally, this one who was fourth year, broke hers down in such a way that you could understand it, even though it was kind of technical. She knew how to explain that. I said, my comment was, I think because she's a fourth year student, she was able to handle the material in a better fashion than say the first year student we heard from her first, plus she went first. She was struggling. She tried and she was good, but she wasn't really ready yet. She needed to work on it some more. 
but the fourth year students, so they learned from the fourth year and from our comments how to go back and readdress their particular 90 minute, excuse me, second message to make it clearer to everybody. Because they only had 90 seconds, like you're in an elevator and you meet somebody and you want to share something that you're doing. You got to be concise. You got to be specific. And you got to speak with passion. We talked to them about more passion in their voice and more excitement in what they're talking about, explaining the terms so the people who aren't in the medical field necessarily could really understand, oh, this is really good research you're doing out there. I want to know more. So we were able to give them some comments that helped us. And then later they told us, after they thanked us for all our comments, the students are competing for money. We didn't know that. A monetary award is going to be given to whoever I guess is the best. Maybe they had the first top three. I don't think just one or two or three. But anyway, so that made it. I said, oh, with that in mind, let me give you some additional suggestions. And so I think the suggestions that they got from us, as you were saying, were very helpful. And they really appreciated them, especially now they have time to go back and rework, rework it and maybe change some things about it so that it's very easy for people to understand and they have a chance to win. So I think it's a very valuable program. I'm glad that I was able to be involved in it for this long period of time. And I'm so glad they keep inviting me back. And that's so key because if we are conducting research that people don't understand, what is the point? Right. Who are we really helping if, you know, the community that we're trying to serve and hope to serve and, and really have a heart to serve don't um, fully understand. So that feedback is really important. Those are our future scientists. Right. Those are the people um, who, who will be leading the charge. And so, again, thank you for your service. Um, I'll, I'll uh, pivot to Dr. Malvaro now and, and, and come on this side so we can have a little so it'll be a little easier for us to pass the mic. But Dr. Malbro, you are with Research Includes Me. Tell us a little bit about what Research Includes Me is all about. So I work for a company called Inside Edge Consulting Group. And we're a consulting firm that works with um, um, many organizations, primary, primarily pharmaceutical companies. But we do a multitude of things for them. So Research Includes Me is one of those programs. And I love it so much because it is clinical research education. And it is geared to raise awareness, increase awareness, and educate on what clinical trials are, so similar to Hypothesis Haven, what clinical trials are, why they are important, and why um, underrepresented communities should consider participating. And so it's been said multiple times today, but our representation matters. We need to be included if we really want the innovations that are coming out to be impactful. So that's what the program is. We partner with community-based, faith-based, civic, social organizations to bring this programming to you. Um, we can do it in a program setting. It can be in-person or, or virtual, but we want to take time. We talk about, we hit the atrocities first. We don't you know, move past the, the trust. We hit the trust first, the mistrust first. And a lot of that was well-earned. We talk about that, but then we talk about the safeguards that came as a result. So there are multiple, multiple, multiple layers of safeguards and, and checks and balances that have been put in place as a result of those things that took place um, because we really want um, our voices to be included. And that's what the program is about. Mm -hmm. And I love that you say we have to kind of own the history, right? Like we have to own that and, and be able to engage that. But then what does it look like to move past, right? Uh, talking about those protections that are now in place and so on and so forth. Um, so what questions do you get um, from, from folks in the community about research? So a lot of times, and I love working with faith-based, um, and I love working with seniors. So some of the questions are, uh, will I be a guinea pig? You know, guinea pig is a question. Um, how do I know I can trust them? And so we spend a good amount of time about talking about informed consent, um, asking questions, bringing folks with you to your appointments or to uh, the discussions that concern clinical trials. Um, doing your research ahead of time, being a good historian, knowing, knowing a lot about your own body, your condition, things that are happening to you, but to continue to ask the question. And then in addition to doing that informed consent about trials, when I'm presenting, I like to take time and use that same information 
for your own personal doctor's appointments because everyone in here is a patient. So when you go to the doctor, you only get about 10 minutes. I used to run templates too for um, a healthcare clinic. You only get about 10 minutes in that appointment. And that 10 minutes should not be just you listening. It should be with you giving information and driving the conversation. So informed consent goes both for trials, but it goes for being a patient and the things that you do each and every day. So uh, spending a lot of time knowing about yourself, asking, bringing somebody with you, depending on what the situation is, you don't hear everything that your doctor says. And when we do this educational program, I don't want the first time you hear about a clinical trial being immediately after you're getting a result that is not, you know, less than favorable because you don't hear anything after that. So if you have some basic knowledge about what it is, then you can ask more questions and you can seek out the guidance you need. And we also encourage um, keeping your primary care physician involved at all times, you know, making sure that they're aware of what's going on just so that you can be, um, you know, have the best information and know what's best for you as an individual. Great. And then what opportunities are there for individuals to partner with you to increase awareness about research participation? Perfect. I love the opportunity. So at Inside Edge, we are good at community. We care about the community. We love to partner. And we have created a trust maker network. And what that means is we work with folks who have already tilled the soil. So I mentioned before, uh, faith-based, community-based, civic, social organizations, um, schools, you know, Hypothesis Haven, whoever is working in the community, we want to work with you so that we can bring this information um, in the simplest form. And we also want to come alongside your organizations to support you. So that support is education, but sometimes that support can also be financial. Well, awesome. This has been a very uh, insightful conversation. I've learned a lot. And thank you for um, ask, answering some of my questions. I'm now going to turn it over to our audience. What questions do you have for our panelists? If you just slip your hand up, I'll, I'll bring you the mic. Good morning, uh, Virgil Elkins with Texas Southern University Center for Biomedical Minority Health Research. Uh, this question is for Dr. Malboro. Um, you were speaking in regards to um, uh, mistrust and distrust with the patients and things of that nature. Do you guys work with patient advocacy groups rather than solely just with the, uh, I guess, the doctor's office or uh, getting them into clinical trials? Advocacy groups. I thought I was like Miss Miss Wanden and just project. Um, we work with advocacy groups. Uh, we prefer that. We prefer the grassroots approach. We want to be able to meet folks where they are so that when questions come, they can feel comfortable in a setting um, where it's already trusted and they can you know, have a level of vulnerability to pose those questions and know that they'll be answered in a respectful way. But yes, we do work with advocacy groups. Thank you. Other questions? I see you. I'm coming. There is a question about whether or not um, our contact information can be shared coming in virtually. So absolutely, we can share that information with you. We'll be sure that um, the event organizers have the information for that panelist, uh, from, for, the, for the panelists, and then we'll get that out. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, I, I'm Zuri Dale again. This is actually a capacity building question for those of us who are trying to encourage people to participate. So I've worked in COVID-19 for the past three years. So you can imagine how daunting it has been trying to um, feel as if because you are African-American, you are carrying the weight of mistrust on your back and feeling like you always have to be the one to kind of combat some of the misinformation. Do you have any recommendations for how we can continue to build our capacities to do that? I mean, it's one thing to sort facts from fiction, but I see a lot of what I consider to be weaponizing your knowledge against people who may just not know. And are there any trainings, any recommendations for how we can continue to build our capacities to encourage people to participate, but knowing that they have a plethora of 
legitimate reasons for why they may not want to. I can speak to that. I mean, that is a very real thing. And I'm, I mean, as black people, we know that, you know, a lot of times I, one of the things that I always hear people talk about kind of like more mainstream is just Tuskegee, Tuskegee. Tuskegee. And to me, it's like, look, I don't even need to look back to Tuskegee. Most people don't even probably even know about that if they're not of a certain age. But all we have to do is just walk around in this world, this current world, and we can see instances of where, you know, we feel like maybe it's a doctor's office or wherever you go that your health is not being taken seriously. And so, you know, it's a very real thing. We have to acknowledge that first. But really where I try to come from is a place of just information, you know, just sharing information with people. I'm not necessarily trying to convince anybody to take part in research. I'm just sharing the information so that people can know it. And the main thing that I do try to impress upon people is these medications, these treatments, they're going to continue to come out. They're, they're going to be put out there. And the safest way that we can make sure that they are going to be beneficial for us is to take part in these trials. Because sooner or later, when you take that Advil or when you take that Tylenol or when you need that heart surgery, um, you know, the chances of it turning out well for you are going to be based on the fact that somebody like you actually took part in the development of that treatment. So it really does behoove us and it is in our benefit to be a part of the process of developing those medications rather than to find out when it's you know available for public usage that that treatment is something that has a bad effect on you know you or somebody who is like you. So good. So, so good. I'm also going to pass the mic to Dr. Malbro. So one of the things that I do um, and we also work with schools, like it, education. So um, my areas right now are New Orleans and, and here in Houston. Um, and I will be doing some good work with SUNO pretty soon just to work with students. So not just social, I'm a social worker by profession. I want to say that. But social work students, nursing students, addictive behavior students, we're doing some really, really good work. Um, but when I start some of my programmings, depending on the audience, I'll start off with asking some really simple questions. If I have a headache, what would you offer me right now in your purse? You know, and some folks will pull out aspirin Advil. Um, if uh, I, I have a new uh, allergy to shrimp, what would you have? You know, my EpiPen, I keep them all the time. Um, if you want to shed a few pounds, things are happening. It's not, yay, everybody has their thing. And I start singing the Ozempic song, right? But I mentioned to folks, or if, if my knees are a little shaken, I might need something, some new hardware. All of those things were the result of a clinical trial, right? So not all trials are... Um, medication-based, some of them are lifestyle, et cetera. But I talk and spend time with them to get them from one spot to the other. So when I leave, if they go from a not at all likely to participate to a somewhat likely, I'm okay with that. But I'm learning when it comes to capacity, you have to keep talking. It is about a relationship. So when we do our trust maker network, it's relationship-based. So it's not a one and done if I, can, if I can help it. Some folks might not want to see me again, but I want to keep working with you. I want to keep you know tilling the soil with you and, and break Breaking those things down so that it can go from a mm -mm to to maybe this isn't for me, but I can share it with somebody else. And so it does take time. It really is relationship based. There is a patience that is built in to be able to do the work, uh, any community work. But I think it's important and it's worth it. So it, it's a it's a slow build, but it's happening. And partnering um, with institutions, partnering with organizations is the way to get that started. Thank you. Are there other questions from our audience? We have a virtual question. So the second question is coming in uh, virtually from Dr. from Janetta Hawkins. And the question is, how can, what can be done to support our work, to support our research? You're in the building. You can meet me at the table. I have uh, some trust maker contact forms. I would love to be able to come to your church, your school, um, do some work with the organizations that you take part in to get the word out. You know, so I'm, I'm happy to do that. That's one way. Um, but to share the information. So once you get it, share it with somebody. Um, share what you've learned. 
if you hear something that is, um, I don't say less than positive, but something that'll keep us stagnant, if you know better, then share that information so that they can now know. Encourage them to do some research on their own, learn some stuff, or maybe go to Hypothesis Haven and bring their kids so that you can start early, right? So um, that's the way. When we know better, pass it on and share. That's my thought. Can I see another question in the back? Hi, I have a two part question. I wanted to know um, how can you become a participant uh, in your um, studies and how often or convenient is it to do so? So I'll say that, and I'll let somebody from the panelists uh, answer this question, but uh, we have a clinical trial recruitment fair happening right after this. So there are a number, there's a number of opportunities for you to uh, hear about, learn about the different uh, research projects that are, that are going on. Um, and, and, you know, depending on the, the research, depending on the question that's being asked, the intervention, whether it be a lifestyle intervention or a medical, uh, the, the requirements are going to be a little bit different. The time commitment is going to be a little different. The ask will be different. Um, but does anybody else? Well, I was going to say, and just in terms of um, pediatric clinical trials, that is actually um, another part of um, our mission is just really sharing those opportunities. So on our website, on our social, so you can go to hypothesishaven.com. But we make it a point to share studies that have to do with children, because it's not only when somebody is like deathly ill or really sick that you can be a part of a clinical trial. They have clinical trials on mental health. Um, ADHD, all sorts of different things, even just lifestyle, nutrition. I know there's a table out there where they're looking at just ways of cooking. So there are so many different types of research you can be a part of. But a lot of times, if you're not necessarily in the medical center, or if you're not really connected, even if you're going to your regular doctor, they're not necessarily thinking about um, ways to, um, you know, put you in a trial. They're, they're probably just trying to fix like whatever the immediate issue is. So on our platforms, we definitely like to share um, research that has to do with children um, so that you can come and bring your children to be part of research and they can kind of get familiar with that process um, from young so that, you know, as they get older, it may be something that they can also still take a part of. Thank you. Other questions? Any other questions? I'll let, the question is about age limits of participation. It all depends on the study. So each study, so each sponsor has requirements. And so it would just really depend. So if you're interested in something, um, I would say, you know, do some research or ask those questions. You can start practicing by asking at the recruitment fair. Um, I also wanted to say to the question about how things happen. And, and Ms. Rebecca, you talked about it. Um, there are different phases of clinical trials. Right. And in that first phase, well, the first human study phase is for healthy volunteers. Right. So there are different phases of those things. And to her point, they, they need everybody's participation and there um, there's room for everybody. Now, maybe not for every study uh, based on what they're looking for, but there is room for everybody. See a question over here. I wondered uh, if you ever have conversations about pursuing uh, education about genetic illnesses with the participant of uh, the potential participants, and if so, what impact does that have if they know about their genetic history on motivating them to participate in the research study? So if I'm understanding the question correctly, you're just saying if there are people that have genetic conditions, how can they be involved in research or how will we approach people with? Yeah, well, I can definitely speak to from, so in addition to founding Hypothesis Haven, I've act, I actually work in the clinical research industry and have for the last two decades. And, you know, definitely there are a lot of genetic components to a lot of diseases. And um, there are things that we're still finding out to this day. So that definitely is important. And one thing I did want to point out is that it's not necessarily that when we talk about diversity in research, it's very important. It's not necessarily that you can look at a person's cell and tell if they're black or white or whatever, but 
what it really represents is the shared culture and history, um, all of the different components that our ancestors have gone through and that affect us up to this day. And really the most important number when you're talking about your health is not even like your age or your blood pressure, really your zip code. Because again, that represents some of those social things, you know, what kind of grocery stores you go to, what kind of food you have access to, what kind of job you have access to. And all these things do impact your health and can actually have an impact, you know, on your genes at a certain point. And so it is very important important for people of different backgrounds to be involved, to be um, participating in research, because then we can actually take and look at you know, on a genetic level, like, what does this look like? What does cancer look like in a person from this background on a genetic level? What does diabetes look like to see if some of those differences, are they, you know, are people just born that way and they're passed down or are they actually being caused by you know, racism or are they being caused by, you know, just things that are impacting us through our environments? And so that is very important. And so, you know, when I did speak to people, I didn't work in genetic research. I worked in oncology but those were the kind of conversations that, you know, you're just trying to find out people's history. I think it was mentioned up here, just being able to know your history when you go to the doctor, sharing that information, because all of that information, all of that data does get analyzed after the fact. And then it can help scientists begin to kind of tie together some of those different trends that they see across all of the people that are in the study and say, hey, there's something there. Like genetically, there's something we need to know about. And that can also help them to come up with um, different treatments um, that can actually try to um, try to you know solve that problem. Thank you. Well, look, we're running short on time, so we're gonna have to wrap things up. But if you all have additional questions, um, our panelists will likely be available afterwards um, to discuss any questions you might have. Just want to thank our panel members and and the audience for all of the qu great questions. Um, and I hope that something that was said today really piqued your interest in uh, participating in research. I think one of the things to keep in mind is that we are the ones who sort of bear the, the burden when we don't participate in research. That affects, that affects us. Um, and so engaging in, in research and in, in, in the health of your community is super important. And so I, I, I urge everyone here, right, to just join that fight, to set things right, to, to reduce health disparities um, in our communities. As I mentioned earlier, um, there's a clinical trials uh, fair going on afterwards, so you'll have an opportunity to participate um, in that if you so choose. Um, but we all have a role to in play um, in ensuring that our community and all communities, right, have an opportunity to receive um, fair and uh, have, a, have a fair and just opportunity uh, to receive their optimal health. So thank you all so much. Okay, so that kind of wraps up the panel. Um, what we want to do is call the names of two raffle winners. The names were already chosen. So there are some wonderful bags for two people. And they are Shirley Morrison. Are you here? Where are you? Okay, yay. Come get your bag. And then Donna Akinson Travis. Are you here? <laughs> Miss Donna looking like I never win anything. Come get your bag. Okay. <laughs> we will have an opportunity for more prizes at the end. So right now we've reached a point in the program where we want to give you a final opportunity to go around and review the study opportunities. So I'm going to tell you, I went to every single study. Okay, I stopped by every single table. And there is some wonderful information available. Um, and this was actually mentioned on the panel. Um, when we think about health outcomes and improving health outcomes, it actually has more to do with the social determinants than it does genetic markers and even development of the disease themselves. And as I was looking around at the studies and I was seeing some of the study incentives for participation, whether or not a person necessarily believes in the science, there is some family that can benefit from enrolling their infant at four months old into the study out there 
for a $300 debit card, right? And our people deserve that. It, it's a perfect example of how we perish from a lack of knowledge because everyone else, not only are they participating in the studies, not only does the data represent them, but they're getting all the benefit. I mean, gift cards, free parking, groceries, all of the things. So even if it does not apply to you, if you could please write down the name of someone who you know, right? If you know someone who's 75 and older who may benefit from the dementia study, suggest them, take the information back to them, okay? Um, so we have a few minutes, right, to go to the tables and review the studies one last time. It is a range of opportunities available. And the ask is that you all return to this room at 1.30, for closing remarks. And at that time, we will also have um, some additional raffles. So please take the time to go and look at them one more time and be back seated in this room at 1.30. One other thing to mention, thank you so much, Zuri. One other thing to mention is we have a QR code here on the screen. Um, please share your thoughts and your feedback with us on the uh, sessions and the event today. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what worked well. <laughs> it's okay. Let us know what worked well, um, what additional questions that you may have. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you.
If you have not done so already, please complete the evaluation survey. There is a QR code. I see a few of us taking a picture of that. That is extremely important for any future programming. Thank you for completing the survey, ladies. It's extremely short, so it'll take you two minutes, two minutes to do. Right there. You gotta click. Let's click right there. Let me turn it this way. Let me see what's going on here. I only turned it that way because I thought it was vivid. I think that's it right there. I think it's coming. Is it coming? There we go. I think that's it. There we go. Oh no. Take the camera off and go back to the internet. How do you take the okay. camera off? And then go back to the internet. It pulled up. Oh, you're going to get it. Yeah, because it pulled up, but I'll take a picture of it. Give it a couple seconds. Thank you for completing the evaluation survey. This data is going to be extremely valuable for future programming. It was taking a minute. Okay. Erica, and then get their raffle ticket. If you have your passport fully complete, please bring your passport to the front so you can get your raffle ticket. Completed passports, please bring those to the front. We're repurposing it. I think we might have Okay, we're good. We'll defer to you. So, do you want me to do the raffle first or call them up first? You can do the raffle first. Go ahead, do the raffle. So, just pick two. Come in. Yeah. Come in. Yeah. All right, so we are going to call a raffle, two raffles actually. So if we could give a moment so that we can hear the numbers. Okay, so the first one. All right, we're going to call the numbers, so make sure you can hear. Do we have any last-minute passports? Bring them up. Okay, let me put those back so I can draw them again. Any last-minute passports? Yes, ma'am. She put the thing on there, but it went away. It went away. I don't see it. Okay. Okay. Where are your camera? <laughs> yeah, go for the camera. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. She just took the picture, but it ran away. There you go, beautiful. All right, last moment passports. All right. Going once. Passports going twice. All right. I think we have all of the passports that are going to be entered. Have Pat. Okay, Miss Pat. Okay, Miss Pat chose this one, not me. So I'm just reading the number seven seven six eight eight zero. Who is that? Oh, congratulations. Now, who is it? I see two of y'all coming up here. Mm -mm. She trying to get 
trying to get her prize. Look at this little thing in the way. <laughs> Let like me check this. Let me you say, never too late. Okay, that's it. The next one. All right. Oh, no. Here, this was mine because it got my card in. Oh, yeah. I think it's the other bag right there. Yeah. All right, Miss Pat, did you choose one? Okay. 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 So this number is 776-886. 776-886. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, so we have now um, reached the end of our program. But before we depart, I want to invite, excuse me, colleagues, if we could just get one moment so that we could properly edify the founders of 50 Hoops who are going to come up and give us closing remarks, Pat and Ed Sanders. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. You are so We want to at first thank all of you who participated in this wonderful event. We especially want to thank Cassandra and Erica for all they've done to make this a successful event. I'm not a talker myself. When people say, tell us about you, what do I do? I pass the mic. So right now, thank you, and I'm passing the mic to my wife back. Oh, hey, not the applaud for us. Please applaud this Houston team that has made this a phenomenal, phenomenal. We have started 50 Hoops in 2021. Cassandra, I've known her for almost 30 years. And when we initiated our first 24 legends in 2021, we had no idea that when the COVID was coming, the COVID was in the midst, that we would be live in 2024. This is the epitome of perfection, of speakers, of vendors. And Miss Betty, Miss Betty Stewart. <laughs> What this has done with the NBLIC, Miss Betty Stewart, and the five legend of legends that we have had uh, inducted this year expands all of our coalitions, all of our networks, all of our legends in over 20 cities where we all as one NBLIC, we care all of the groups, University of South Florida, MD Anderson Cancer Center, Moffitt Cancer Center, Morehouse College, and on and on. We are growing in such magnitude now, spreading the word of African Americans in clinical trials, in healing. God created us as perfect. We is our responsibility to move forward with his work. We're preachers, kids, so don't let me start preaching. This has been a wonderful day from the food, the vendors, the people, the love that we have all shared today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pat, Mr. Ed, thank you so much. It's been an honor to have you all here and to support the work that 50 Hoops is doing. Um, so thank you so much.
me turn it over to Cassandra, our past co-chair of NBLIC, Chair Emeritus. <laughs> Again, I just want to thank everybody for showing love to Miss Betty. This was a wonderful event, and she is so deserving of, of this honor of being a legend in our community. I remember when I moved to Houston from Washington, D.C., meeting Miss Betty, and we've been talking almost every day ever since. She sends me Bible scriptures in the morning, and we read those and um, grow with her. And every year she contacts me. What we're going to do this year, Cassandra? So she is an excellent community partner. I just love her to death. I just love Windsor Village and the team. They do everything in excellence. So thank you for everybody for being here. Thank you for the staff that helped, the volunteers, the food, everything, the vendors for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This concludes our program. Feel free to go back to the vendor area. If you want to visit for a little bit longer, but other than that, you are dismissed. Thank you. Thank you.